there are two kinds of good adaptation. Type 1 is your authentic adaptation. It captures the essence of the original, but makes it work in a new medium. It may not be identical, but it feels like the same thing. Type 2 is your doing its own thing adaptation. It treats the original as a starting point, but takes it in a new direction. Still good, but in a different way. And then there's Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which is tricky to pin down. Is it Type 1 or Type 2? Both? Neither? The more I examine Edgar Wright's 2010 adaptation of the hit indie comic by Brian Lee O'Malley, the more contradictions I find. It was a critical success, but a box office disaster. It's become a cult classic, but is often dismissed as all style and no substance. Time has only been kind to it. They marked the 10-year anniversary with a cast reunion and a limited re-release in theatres. But the comics are still better, right? The movie is fiercely loyal to the source material. Looking at it, you'd assume they just used the comic as a storyboard. And you'd be right. It doesn't just copy scenes from the comic, it meticulously recreates individual panels. Even in places where the movie deviates, it's still crafted out of bits and pieces pilfered from other parts of the comic. And like a comic book, it uses visual onomatopoeia, captions, multiple panels, and varying frame sizes. Its rapid pace is intended to mimic the speed at which your eyes flit between panels. It is dedicated to telling this story in the exact same way the comic does. But, as is often said on this channel, an accurate adaptation doesn't always make for an authentic one. Like, it's not technically wrong to say Das sind der Bienenknie, but tell it to a German and they'll say Da ist eine Biene? Translating the visual language of a comic right down to the ink doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in the language of a live-action movie. The Scott Pilgrim comic may be about fights and robots and magic, but it's primarily a slice-of-life character drama, a coming-of-age story about that awkward phase between teenage and young adulthood. It's not a fantasy story per se, more of a heightened reality with fantastical elements. Vegans have superpowers, defeated enemies drop coins, your girlfriend might have a Mary Poppins bag from which she retrieves a giant hammer. In this world, these things are ordinary. It's just Toronto, Canada. The story is told almost like a stream of consciousness, a messy collection of seemingly random scenes, because that's how life feels at that age. The big dramatic set pieces are separated with small, relatable moments in Scott's day-to-day -day life. In the movie, there's no time for that. Though its moment-to-moment -moment pace mimics the comic, the narrative pace is very different. The comic spans about a year of Scott's life. Whereas the movie covers, what, a few days? It's hardly unusual for movie adaptations to streamline their narratives. The comic does have a lot of fluff the story can survive without. In one scene, the characters address the reader directly to teach them how to make vegan shepherd's pie. Sure, that can go. But while I tend to say a more efficient story is a better one, all that stuff is a big part of the comic's Scott Pilgrimness. O'Malley's art style is simple but charming. It's kind of grungy and imperfect, using a little to do a lot. The books have since been re released in full colour, but I kind of prefer the original black and white, since it's more evocative of Japanese shonen manga, which the series is strongly influenced by. 
By contrast, the movie is flashy and stylish. It's colorful and demands your attention. Onomatopoeia and motion lines may be run-of-the-mill in a comic, but put them in live action and they become mechanically impressive. The movie is a carefully considered construction. Even when copying the books exactly, it makes them into a completely different thing. Okay, but different doesn't always mean bad. Sure, I like this, but I also like this. Though the movie strives for authenticity, type 1, it ultimately fails to fully recapture that essence of the comics. But that failure winds up catapulting the movie further into type 2. By missing the moon, does Scott Pilgrim land among the stars? Because of the overlapping vocabularies used to analyze comics and film, their use of framing, motion, and respective relationships to consumer culture, to name of a few, adapting comics into film, and vice versa, is hardly a novel concept. Not all adaptations take a transmedial approach, however. Live-action films often sacrifice the materiality of comics to realism, prioritizing plot and action over form. Live-action film is, needless to say, more realistic than the artwork of a comic. Most comic book movies, even if they try to evoke some sense of the comic, wind up retelling their stories in a more naturalistic way. Ghost World has a saturated colour palette, but loses the comic's distinctive green tint. Blue is the warmest colour is entirely naturalised, leaving no trace of the comic's watercolour softness. The CGI of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a more realistic interpretation of the psychedelic perspective-shifting artworks of Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. Watchmen is another adaptation that is meticulous in its recreation, but in translation to the screen, the comic panels no longer function as comic panels. The way the comic conveys detailed movement through a series of near-identical images becomes ordinary slow motion which is more evocative of director Zack Snyder's style than the comic. The regular rhythm of the neat 3x3 three three page layout, with its juxtapositions, creative arrangements, and scenes in parallel, is lost entirely. Sometimes that's just how adaptation goes. There are outliers, Sin City and Dick Tracy, for instance. But even these are just stylistic movies. They evoke the look of a comic without fully adapting the visual language of one. A naturalistic approach wouldn't work for Scott Pilgrim, so much of what the comic does relies on the fact it is a comic. The traditional language of film just doesn't have the vocabulary to communicate everything the comic is saying. But Edgar Wright looked at this with his director of photography, Bill Pope, and said, well then, Let's just invent our own visual language. The Scott Pilgrim movie is often examined as an example of transmedia. Now, that's not transmedia, although... Transmedia storytelling is when a single story is told across multiple media. Comic books could be considered transmedia, a fusion of still images and the written word. And Scott Pilgrim, the comic, is especially transmedial, incorporating elements from anime, music, and video games. So it only makes sense the movie adaptation would also take a transmedial approach. Holy understatements, Batman. In her essay on Scott Pilgrim, leader Zaitlin Wu draws comparisons to the visual onomatopoeia in 1960's Batman and split screen in Ang Lee's Hulk neither of which are particularly celebrated. Scott Pilgrim succeeds in ways its predecessors didn't by blurring reality and illusion in a more dreamlike space. In Batman, the onomatopoeia obscures the action, or even fully interrupts it, which may have more to do with masking the ropey choreography. In Scott Pilgrim, it is a significant part of how the shots are constructed. Frequently, as in the comic, the onomatopoeia exists in physical space. And though it may seem redundant to illustrate a sound when, in a movie, you can actually hear it, they are sometimes used to draw attention to a particular sound, or else tied less to a sound and more to an action, because they also play a part in how the film conveys movement. 
Scott Pilgrim constructs its action not as continuous motion, but as a comic-like series of static images. Individual moments are highlighted, frozen, or slowed down, with the illusion of speed maintained through quick cutting. Scott sits in front of the computer in medium frame. Next, the view cuts to Wallace in medium close-up, then back to medium frame Scott sitting cross-legged in front of the door. The story has not yet introduced supernatural elements, and Scott's movement from one side of the room to the other cannot logically take place within a naturalistic reading of the temporal structure of these moments. The entirety makes sense in a comic reading, however, if each moment is read as a separate physical frame. Speaking of frames, Scott Pilgrim breaks the constraints of its frame. The frame's size and shape can change, even shot to shot, which isn't just evocative of comics, but also the differing aspect ratios of cinema, anime, and video games. There are frames within frames. Split screen is used to create a sense of simultaneous action, to reinforce physical divisions, or to highlight moments within a scene. Characters can also break these constraints, crossing over the cuts between shots, or even reaching outside the frame. Where Ang Lee's usage rubbed up against the naturalism of film, here, the malleable frame is an extension of the movie's malleable space and time. It even has gutters, the space between the panels of a comic. Sometimes they're identical to a comic. Sometimes an in-world object divides the frame. Sometimes there's literal black space between shots. And what is particularly unique for film is the use of what John Bodner identifies as a Bactinian double voice. Oof, who knew there was this much academia about Scott Pilgrim? This double voice is what it sounds like, one voice made of two voices. In the sense Bodner means this, it's like how the voice of a novel can be made from the voice of its characters as well as the voice of a narrator. Or like how comic books will use speech bubbles for its characters and captions for the editor. In the Scott Pilgrim comics, O'Malley makes extensive use of captions, often to convey information the characters already have, or aren't being forthright about. And that is translated directly into the movie. You are incorrigible. I don't know the meaning of the word. Films rarely have a voice of the author like this, yet Scott Pilgrim turns it into a literal voice. That was so long ago now I can barely remember. Scott is acutely aware that his last salon haircut took place exactly 431 days ago. That's Bill Hader, by the way. He's credited only as the voice. But whose voice is that meant to be? In the comics, it seems to be the voice of O'Malley himself. But the movie's voice is not the author, it's sometimes a narrator, but it's also a video game announcer? Get ready! Here we go! The movie takes the transmedia elements of the comic and makes them even more transmedial. The comics are about video games, so the movie looks and sounds like a video game. The comics are about anime, so the movie uses motion backgrounds, split-screen reactions, and inner monologue like an anime. The comics are about music, so the movie is basically a musical. There's also a scene done in the style of Seinfeld, which isn't from the comics, that's the movie doing its own transmedia. The movie may not recreate the feel of the comic, but in the attempt, it manages to carve out its own unique identity. This new filmic language isn't just a bridge from the film to the comic, but also to all of the comic's inspirations and to the medium of comics as a whole. To paraphrase Zaitlin Wu, while other adaptations may be based on comics, Scott Pilgrim is a movie about comics. Okay, that's all french fries and gravy, but what is the movie actually about? I get that we're rejecting the filmic naturalism of prioritising plot over form, but the plot still matters, right? What is this all for? And here, the movie faces a big obstacle. Or rather, it faces seven. Both the movie and the comic tell the story of Scott Pilgrim, a dorky 22-year-old who, in order to date the girl of his dreams, is forced to defeat in battle her seven evil exes. 
But while the comic can devote an entire volume to each fight, obviously the movie needs to be more economical with its 112 minute runtime. The movie is incredibly faithful to the comics, to a point. On the one hand, there's very little in it that doesn't come from the comics. On the other, there's too much in the comics for it all to fit. And the further we get into the movie, the more crowded it becomes. The first act of the movie follows book one pretty identically. Scott is dating a 17-year-old high school student named Knives Chow, and all of Scott's friends are adamant this isn't a real relationship. Are you really happy or are you really evil? Like, do I have ulterior motives or something? I'm offended, Kim. Are you legitimately moving on or is this just you being insane? Can I get back to you on that? Their relationship is uncomplicated, completely chaste, and, for Scott, entirely forgotten the moment he meets Ramona Flowers. Ramona is a mysterious pink-haired delivery girl who's just moved to Canada from the States. Scott is immediately obsessed, stalks her a bit, asks her out, sleeps with her but doesn't sleep with her, and invites her to his band's show that evening. Except he already invited Knives. Hey! Hey! To make an awkward situation awkwarder, halfway through his set, Scott is attacked by a pirate-themed guy who can summon demons and shoot fireballs. My name is Matthew Patel, and I'm Ramona's first evil ex-boyfriend. Scott defeats him pretty handily, but learns this is a thing that's going to keep happening if he wants to date Ramona. If we're gonna date, you may have to defeat my seven evil exes. Here is where the first book ends, and where the movie begins to… not deviate exactly, it still mostly follows book two, but things start to get a little… jumbled. Pressured by his roommate Wallace, Scott breaks up with knives. It's brutal and Knives gets a bit obsessed with Scott. Scott has a second date with Ramona, which combines a few scenes from book two and three regarding Scott's insecurities and his last big breakup. Scott fights evil ex number two, actor-skater Lucas Lee, which is kinda similar to the book, only way more dramatic. I guess that's to make up for the movie cutting Ramona's big fight with Knives. More importantly, Scott gets a call from his evil ex, Natalie, now famous musician Envy Adams. She's back in town and invites Scott to her band's show, where Scott discovers Todd, the vegan superpowered pretty boy Envy dumped him for, is also Ramona's third evil ex. This is where book three gets into Scott's history with Envy and rivalry with Todd, which takes up the whole book. But we're an hour into the movie now, and we've still got five evil exes left to defeat. We gotta hurry this along. The movie drops all the backstory, instead taking one scene from book three, the tense backstage talk, pairs it down a bit, gives Todd more to do, and lets that become the fight. The base battle is lifted from another scene, and the whole thing wraps up with the same gag from the book. Freeze! Vegan police! Todd Ingram, you're under arrest for veganity violation. Book four is about Scott moving in with Ramona, getting a job, and committing to his relationship. No time for that in the movie though, so we go directly into the next fight. Girl from earlier? To be fair, the movie had dropped in this scene from book four. Punch me in the boob! So this doesn't come out of nowhere, but the fight itself is mostly based on Ramona's fight with Envy from book three. So I'm about to kick yours out of the Great White North. <laughs> I'm sending you back to Gideon in a thousand pieces, you slut! As well as a bit from the free comic book day bonus story. I don't think I can hit a girl. They're soft. With that done, the movie goes straight into the next fight against X's five and six, the Katia Nagi twins, which bears no resemblance to anything in the books. Oh, except for this short moment with knives, which is kind of like this scene in book three. What is the same is Ramona leaves Scott, but where book five has her literally vanishing in a flash of light, the movie has her getting back together with X number seven, Gideon Graves. You know, we really should be thanking each other. I mean, if it wasn't for me, Ramona would never have been with you, but if it wasn't for you, she wouldn't have gotten back with me, so I guess it all shakes out, huh? Scott has a faux pas with Wallace. Ah! Turn off the light! And Wallace kicks him out of the apartment. That's from book four. But then Gideon calls Scott, which brings the movie back in line with book six. Gideon invites Scott to his new club, the Chaos Theatre, 
where Scott faces him down in a climactic battle. However, the meat of this fight is built almost entirely from things the movie skipped in earlier books. From book four, Scott says the L word to Ramona, and it's not lesbians. Because I'm in love with her. Scott earned the power of love. From book two, Knives swoops in to take her revenge against Ramona. You stole him! And from book five, Scott confesses to Ramona that he cheated on her. He cheated on me with Knives? No, I... cheated on Knives with you. Is there a difference? Also, the outfits the band are wearing here are from book three. As is this. Let's both be girls. Getting back on track with book six, Scott is stabbed, dies, has an epiphany, kinda. I feel like I learned something. But using an extra life he picked up earlier, he repeats the final battle, no longer fighting for Ramona, but for himself. Scott earned the power of self-respect. Scott takes responsibility for hurting Knives and reconciles with her. No Knives, I hurt you. And with Knives' help, Scott defeats Gideon. Cable! Freeing Ramona from his spell on her, Knives encourages Scott to get back with Ramona, and together they leave Toronto through a magic door into the unknown. Phew. Things kinda got away from them, huh? Well, not exactly. I mean, as an adaptation of the comic, it literally loses the plot. It's forced to cut out most of the detail, it rushes through the whole back half of the story, and everything concertinas together into a mush that only superficially resembles the source material. But then, how much does the movie actually count as an adaptation? How do you adapt something that doesn't exist yet? The first draft of the screenplay was written in early 2006. At that time, only two of the comic books had actually been published. Now, they stalled a lot. Edgar Wright went and made Hot Fuzz in the meantime, so most of the books had come out by the time shooting began. Even so, O'Malley was still working on the books the entire time the movie was being made. The final book was published only a week before the movie was first screened, and a month before it was released. So it's actually impressive how faithful to the comics the movie ended up being. Even when the movie deviated from the comic, it often took inspiration from O'Malley's notes. The Amp vs. Amp battle against the Katy and Agi twins, and the mind control chip Gideon puts on Ramona's neck. These were things O'Malley was planning to do in later books, and only changed his mind when the time came to write them. Which would then leave it to the filmmakers to decide whether to stick with what they had, or make a change. But in the original draft of our script, we amalgamated, we amalgamated Envy and Roxy, and Roxy and Envy, together. Yeah. Which, you know, and then as soon as book four was out, we changed it back. O'Malley was very involved with the movie's production. He was in regular contact with Wright, he gave feedback on their screenplay drafts, and even did some uncredited rewrites, which undoubtedly influenced the way O'Malley wrote later books. You guys wrote uh, Roxy before, or you wrote the, the bisexual jokes before I got to that part in the book, so I stole some dialogue back. Yeah, sexy face. You sexy had a sexy phase. phase was one of you guys' lines. You and your production designer designed this club first, so I just ripped it right off. <laughs> Both comic and movie were being created side by side, in conversation with each other. And this is another aspect of the movie's transmediality. It's not just multiple mediums existing within a single story, it's a single story existing across multiple mediums. So maybe it's not fair to think of the movie as rearranging pieces of the comic. Rather, the movie and comic create these pieces together. They share and trade them, but use them differently. The film is like a, a bizarro version of the book. Yeah, the, I, I like that. You remember those old Choose Your Own Adventure books? Yeah. The idea that, that because we've Scott chosen Pilgrim, different paths. Yeah, yeah, Scott turned left instead of right, and you end up with a completely <laughs> different film. Yeah, the movie is not haphazard with the way it fits these pieces together. It structures its narrative according to the hero's journey. If you're familiar with screenwriting, you'll probably have seen Christopher Vogler's interpretation of this: twelve steps across three acts, all of which are very visible in Scott Pilgrim. 
You have your call to adventure, your meeting the mentor, your hero crossing the threshold from the ordinary world to a strange one. The fantastical elements don't really get going until after Scott meets Ramona. So, though the movie mixes up bits and pieces from the comic, so long as each piece slots into one of the twelve steps, it all fits together into a coherent narrative. The climactic battle doesn't feel messy, because it follows steps 9 to 11. 9, the reward. Scott earned the power of love. Sometimes called seizing the sword. 10, the road back. Right. And 11, the resurrection. Realized quite literally. Scott earned the power of self-respect. The movie's climax gathers all the most dramatic moments for each character which makes sense for a climax. And by slotting them into the stages of the hero's journey, the movie does a pretty good job of knitting them together. Only, there's a problem. By rushing past certain plot points and rearranging certain pieces, this climax leaves all the characters stalled at different stages of their arcs. Ramona is still in book five, Knives has backtracked to book two, and Scott has dropped off the books entirely. But hey, that might be okay. The movie doesn't have to end its story the same way the comics do. That ending hadn't even been written yet. At this stage, O'Malley didn't even know who Scott would end up with at the end. So the movie is free to gather up all of these loose threads and tie them together into whatever satisfying conclusion it wants. Which, well, it tried. In the original cut, the movie ended with Scott getting back together with Knives, which makes some sense. Now that her arc from the first two books is spread across the whole film, now that she's part of the climactic battle, she has a much bigger role in this story. Scott's reconciliation with her is realised through the two of them defeating Gideon together, in a fight that harks back to their date at the arcade, which has a cyclical neatness but also sells Knives and Scott as the more natural pairing. However, test audiences were divided. It felt like it disempowered Knives. Some people, quite rightly, exactly what you said, felt cheated. Plus, he, he goes right back where he started in that version, which is like, he learns something, but he just, you know, he, he doesn't really go anywhere. And then Knives doesn't really go anywhere. So they rewrote the ending for Scott to get back together with Ramona which puts the movie's ending more in line with the comics. According to Wright, the movie's ending was reshot three months before release. But what's not clear is when the new ending was written, or when they first started having conversations about changing it. O'Malley participated in the rewrite, he was part of these conversations. So it's possible he influenced the filmmakers to follow the ending of the comic. Or, depending at what stage he was at with the book, it's also possible being part of these conversations influenced the ending O'Malley was still writing. Or even, this might not be a chicken and egg situation, but two endings created in tandem with each other. I wonder if, because this story was being created across multiple mediums at once, that made it harder to see the distinction between the two. Because while this ending works for the comic, it doesn't quite fit with the story the movie is telling. Because in the movie, Scott Pilgrim is a different person. The decision to cast Michael Serra as Scott has received some amount of criticism. Sarah has a reputation for playing adorkable wallflowers, what with his superbads, his Junos, his arrested developments, and the like. Some reviewers attributed the movie's poor performance with audiences being bored of Sarah playing this sort of character, while many fans of the comic were vocal in their opinion that Scott is not the sort of character Sarah is suited for. Scott Pilgrim is, in some ways, breaking typecast for Sarah. Sure, Scott is a bit of a dork, but he's also a lady killer, a jackass, an awesome action hero. And there was disagreement as to whether awesome is something Michael Cera can convincingly play. It's interesting that there are two kind of schools of thought about the character. One is like, Scott Pilgrim is awesome. The second is Scott Pilgrim believes himself to be awesome. 
Me and Brian Lee O'Malley were always in the latter camp, and as such, I think Michael Cera is the only one that I can think of who can pull off the charm, the goofiness, the massive insecurities that Scott Pilgrim has in the book and in the film. And also, it would be fun to watch him being a badass. Uh, I'm not interested in discussing whether Michael Cera is good or bad in this role. What interests me more is whether the version of Scott he plays makes sense for this film. And here's the thing. Edgar, you just said that Scott believes himself to be awesome, and I'm with you on that. But then you said only Michael Cera can pull off Scott's massive insecurities. Massive insecurities? That doesn't sound like someone who believes he's awesome. It's not that the Scott of the comics doesn't have insecurities, there's the whole haircut thing, there's his lack of closure with Envy. But much more importantly, Comic Scott has a terminal lack of self-awareness. Why are you wearing those wristband things anyway? Don't they make you sweat? No way! They keep me cool. I mean, I, uh... No, you're right. That is better. It wasn't your fault, Kim. It wasn't anyone's fault. Yes, it was. It was your fault. So, how are we affording it today? Am I paying? No, it's cool. I borrowed Wallace's credit card. What? You're a jerk! I'm not! I'm not. We have an understanding. As in, he understands that you're a freeloader? Maybe. Why are you just standing there? Dude, I'm waiting on you. Whereas Movie Scott, if anything, is cripplingly self-aware. Why are you just standing there? Dude, I'm totally waiting on you. Oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed you were too cool to be here on time. Yeah, I don't know. I just I sort of feel like I'm on drugs when I'm with you. Not that I do drugs, unless you do drugs, in which case I do drugs all the time. <laughs> Every drug. Just fickle, impulsive, spontaneous. God, what am I going to do? You're the new kid on the block, right? I've lived here forever. So. There are reasons for you to hang out with me. Sure, Comic Scott can be a bumbling mess too, but that's not because he's self-conscious. Can we go out sometime? Or, I mean, I mean, can we maybe just hang out? Can we get to know each other? You're new in town, right? I've lived here forever. I mean, I mean, there are reasons for you to hang out with me. You're all over the place. But I'm so sincere. Sincerely lame, maybe. It's because he's an idiot. The League of Ramona's evil ex-boyfriends, man. How do you think we're organized enough to come after you like this? I hadn't really thought about it. Why are you looking at me? So, if you want to stay, it's month to month, as per our contract. If you're leaving, leave, and be out by the 27th. Oh, hey, that's my birthday. August 27th is your birthday? Oh. No. Okay, out of my office. All right, movie Scott is no genius either. Step up your game, Scott. Break out the L word. Lesbian? The other L word. Lesbians? Because I'm in lesbians with you. What? I said lesbians. Even so, movie Scott defeats two of the evil exes, not with brawn, but with cunning. But say we drink to my memory. <laughs> Fair trade blend with soy milk? You just drank half and half, baby. Can you do a thingy on that rail? Okay, yes, this one is based on the comic. Kiss Ramona's sweet ass goodbye, Pilgrim. Wait, um, hey, have you seen these stairs over here? But here, it's played as Scott trying to delay the fight. Can you show me a cool trick before you kill me? What? On the stairs, there's like 200 steps and the rails are garbage. It's impossible. Impossible? When it secures him the win, he's disappointed. This sucks! What? Why? You win by default. That was the worst fight ever. Suck it up. Whereas Movie Scott knows exactly what he's doing. Wow, yes. totally bailed. Comic Scott is actually less of a geek and more of a himbo. He's good at fighting and nothing else, falling back on dorky charm to luck his way through adult life. Movie Scott is a socially awkward nerd who bumbles through life by feigning more confidence than he really has. 
Now, to be fair to Michael, his performance is more like Comic Scott than the characters he's famous for. A lot of his dialogue is exactly the same. That said, even when doing and saying the same things as Comic Scott, Michael Sarah Scott is inevitably more Michael Sarah y. What? Like, do I have ulterior motives or something? Are you asking me if I'm a user? Yeah, okay. I'm offended, Kim. Wounded, even. Hurt, Kim. Like, do I have ulterior motives or something? I'm offended, Kim. Wounded, even. Hurt, Kim. Once again, for the people in the back, different doesn't have to mean bad. And these two versions of Scott are not entirely different. The weird thing is, their stories are. In book six, Scott re-encounters all of his exes, and discovers each one remembers their relationships very differently to the way he does. He was not, as he felt, the purely innocent party of his breakups. Truth is, he was careless with his partner's feelings and caused a lot of hurt. This results in Scott facing the Negger Scott, his shadow self, and Scott hopes he can forget his problems by defeating him. It's better than having to live with myself! Everything you've done wrong is just gonna keep following you around, Scott. <laughs> but because Scott doesn't want to forget Ramona, he is defeated by the Negger Scott. Scott is forced to accept that part of himself. By contrast, the movie's version of the Negger Scott is a gag. The movie seems to gear up for one last fight, only for Scott to have a chill hang with the Negger Scott. He's, he's just a really nice guy. We're gonna get brunch next week. We, uh, we actually have a lot in common. Which is dumber, but I'm trying not to hold that against it. The two versions of this story build to opposite conclusions. Movie Scott's story is about a dorky 20-something learning to overcome his insecurities. Comic Scott's story is about a dorky 20-something learning that his self-confidence is misplaced. Movie Scott realises that he's a better person than he believed he was. Comic Scott realises that he needs to become a better person than he's been. And the movie does a game job at making this change work. If this is a story about learning self-respect, it makes sense for Scott to be more insecure. Plus, without the charming art style of the comic, it may be harder to make Scott an appealing character if he's just as big a jerk. So, Michael Sarah's Scott does suit the story the movie wants to tell. Assuming the movie knows which story it wants to tell. It was kind of based on my life at the time. I was in Toronto in my early 20s, playing in a band, and I'd just started dating an American girl. I wanted to do something that reflected my life, but almost to an absurd degree. An action-packed metaphor for everything that was going on in my relationship. The plot of the comics can sometimes get a little messy. You can tell O'Malley was kinda making it up as he went. But even though it lacks the movie's strict adherence to structure, it holds together by having a very clear sense of theme. The heightened reality with all the transmedia references, that's not just for fun. Well, maybe it started that way. But the comic plays with how literal this stuff is supposed to be. For instance, it's made clear Scott has a very poor memory. Okay, as you know, I'm moving in with Holly and Joseph today. If you're here, you volunteered to help out, so let's do it. Hey Holly, what are you doing here? Uh, making iced tea? I live here. Oh wow, Kim's moving in with you guys? That makes a lot of sense. And the comic goes on to suggest this may affect Scott's grasp on reality. Book two begins with a flashback of Scott's relationship with Kim. Kim, let her go, Simon. I've defeated all your evil bosses. You're finished. <laughs> took you long enough. Scott, this sucks. But book six suggests this is not the way it really happened. Simon Lee? But he was a bad guy. Simon Lee, the Chinese kid? I was dating him, Scott. I mean, I think he hugged me once. You're going down, Simon! Ugh. Throwing the reality of all Scott's experiences into question. You could even see Scott Pilgrim as a film where the lead character never wakes up from his daydream. 
There's a point where he walks into the bathroom and then walks out into the school corridor, and it's never clear from that point on whether we're in the real world or not anymore. I say not. So all the fantasy stuff is just Scott's hallucination? In the movie, that makes sense. The malleable space and time is very dreamlike. But with the comics, though you can make that interpretation, I'd say it's a bit too literal. The fantasy elements are metaphors which turn emotional struggles into epic battles. A girl whose messy breakups are literally coming back to thwart her present relationship. A girl with so much baggage she carries a literal bag so infinitely large it contains the inside of her own head and explodes publicly into an avalanche of her personal stuff. A girl who is so prone to running away, she literally vanishes in a flash of light. Ramona may introduce the fantastical elements into the story, but they mostly center on Scott. Nobody else is routinely attacked by enemies. Nobody else is constantly getting into epic fights, unless they are dragged into it via Scott. Scott's friends often seem exasperated by Scott's battles. It even costs him his job at one point. The fantastical elements reveal character. Scott feels like a hero on an epic adventure, so that is the reality he experiences. But it's a drag on the people around him. It gets in the way of being a grown-up. It's a juvenile worldview regarding enemies as pure evil who must be defeated. And it all serves the comic's conclusion. Scott is not as awesome as he believes he is. The very first thing we learn about Scott in both the comic and the movie is that he's in a fake relationship with a teenager. Then he cheats on her the moment a more interesting girl shows up. Scott is unfaithful, both physically and emotionally. Cheating, abandonment, and using is the pattern of his love life. He does it to other people, and other people do it to him. Scott did it to Kim when they dated in high school by not telling her he was moving to Toronto. Envy did it to Scott, she became cold and distant, maybe cheated on him, and hijacked the band he started. However, for reasons we never learn, Envy claims Scott was the one who broke her heart. Ramona and Scott do it to each other. He two-timed her with knives, and when she finds out, she vanishes. Cause Ramona has a history of this too. Let's count them off. One, Ramona was using Matthew to spite the jocks, but changed her mind after a week and a half. Two, Ramona cheated on Lucas the moment she met Todd. Three, Todd blew a hole in the moon for Ramona, only weeks before he did the same thing for Envy. Four, Roxy hunts Scott because she believes he's cheating on Ramona with his old high school friend Lisa. But then Ramona does the exact same thing with Roxy. Five and six, Ramona dated the twins at the same time, each without telling the other. And seven, Gideon is entirely self-centered, right up until his girlfriends leave him, at which point he obsessively collects them like trophies. He is what Scott could become if Scott doesn't learn to be better. Scott and Ramona are kind of perfect for each other, because they're both shitty partners. But they're not the only ones. Kim moves back home after her boyfriend Jason cheats on her with her roommate. Stephen Still's on-off-again relationship with Julie finally ends for good when he cheats on her with Joseph, and learns something about himself. Envy turns against Todd when she discovers he's been sleeping with the band's drummer. Knives only gets with young Neil because she wants to make Scott jealous, and Neil kinda looks like Scott. Wallace is the only one who has healthy relationships. Well, except for making out with Stacy's boyfriend. But still, his casual sex life is used to counterpoint Scott's behavior. If you don't do it, I'm gonna tell Ramona all about knives. First thing when she walks in the door. I swear to God, Scott. But you, you're double standard. These are lies, dirty ones. Double standard. Trying to make up the gay rule book. Every relationship in this story reflects the theme of unfaithfulness. Hurt people hurt people. So when Scott and Ramona decide to go off into the unknown, it's a very apt ending, because they are attempting to break this cycle. I don't know. Maybe we can get somewhere together. Maybe we can get unstuck. We'd have to be careful. It could be a bumpy ride. It could get messy. But maybe. Maybe it'd be worth it. Maybe we just need to hold on. However, when the movie ends the same way, what does that mean? 
This story isn't about cycles of abuse, it's about overcoming insecurities. If Scott truly is awesome, and has been all along, why leave? And why leave with Ramona? This relationship seems bad for them. The problem isn't that the movie is different, it's that it's not different enough. It absorbs things from the comic without considering what purpose they serve. The theme of unfaithfulness and abandonment is still very present in the movie. You of all people should know how sucky it is to get cheated on. Yeah, you kind of disappeared. Yeah, I do that. We all know you're a total lady killer wannabe jerky jerk. It's completely untrue. I was only dating Lucas until the minute Todd walked by. I guess that's not very nice, but I used to be kind of like that. And Kim? I can barely remember. It was high school. She had freckles. I was more alone when we were together than I ever was on my own. You cheated on me, Scott. You cheated on both of us. But it's not what the movie is about. The whole Knives plot, which proportionally takes up much more space of the movie, doesn't fit in a story about learning self-respect. Because Scott was not the person in that relationship who wasn't being respected. Okay, the guilt Scott feels about it plays into his doubts that he's a good person. Trouble is, he's right. Sure, he apologises. I'm really sorry. But he doesn't spend any time on self-reflection. So are we all good? Because that would interfere with the movie's conclusion. It throws into question how awesome he really is. Fitting the story into the hero's journey may help it take the shape of a coherent emotional arc. Scott goes through all the stages from awkward loser to self-assured grown-up. But those stages don't always feel connected. Increasingly, the movie doesn't build on the scenes which came before, it just rushes to the next thing it knows it needs to do. Seven evil exes is too many. The fight against Roxy is rad, but doesn't change anything. Scott and Ramona just go back to the same argument they were having before. Well, now you are being a total ass. Welcome to the club. I love Brie Larson's performance as Envy, but after being built up for an hour, she just drops off the movie without being explored. Shut the f*** Julie. Gideon is a fun villain, but it's never explained why he formed the League, what his motivation was, what enmity does he have with Scott. Well, I've got a beef with you. And all the transmedial elements are impressive and entertaining, but why? Why any of this? What point are we trying to make here? Oh, I don't know. What? Look, this isn't a review. I'm not here to tell you whether you'd enjoy this movie or not. It's 13 years old. I imagine you already know. What makes the film so interesting to me is I don't know whether I love it or hate it. There are things about it that work really well, and things that really don't. It's often in conflict with itself, trapped between those two types of adaptation. Is it authentic to the original? Well, yes. It rejected a naturalistic approach and told its story using the language of a comic. It captured the feeling of reading the comic by embracing transmedial storytelling. But also, no, it can't be authentic. The way the comic tells its story just doesn't fit into a movie, and the things that do fit take on new, unintended meanings that build to a completely different conclusion. So is it an adaptation that does its own thing? Absolutely. Since the comics were still being written at the time, the movie was forced to invent itself, which included inventing a new visual language. The movie is a musical, multimedial tour de force the comics could never have been. But also, it doesn't quite break free from the comic shackles. It is too much like the comics to realise it's saying something different. Even when they had free licence to write whatever ending they wanted, they found themselves written into a corner where either answer didn't quite fit. Nevertheless, I am more impressed by a bold failure than an easy win. And Scott Pilgrim is not an easy thing to adapt. It is so reliant on being a comic, it's amazing the movie makes it work as well as it does. And the problems the movie has are all plot and theme, which ought to be fixable. It feels so close to being something truly incredible. And even with its flaws, 
the movie is doing something revolutionary. There aren't many films like Scott Pilgrim. Its place in cinema history should not be overlooked. It launched or boosted the careers of most of its cast, many of whom have gone on to star in other comic book movies. It's still being cited as an influence, the MCU show Ms. Marvel evoked a similar visual style. And even though it's animation, I can't help but wonder if the Spider-Verse would be what it is without Scott Pilgrim. What just does arañitas? It's kind of amazing, something as risky and creative and expensive as Scott Pilgrim actually got made. But I'm glad it did, warts and all. So, if you ask me, whether the movie is good or not is not the most interesting question. A better question is, with all the movie's successes and failures, what can we learn from it about how to adapt comic books? And especially, what have the filmmakers learned from it? Back in March, Brian Lee O'Malley announced Scott Pilgrim the Anime to be released imminently. Edgar Wright is returning as executive producer and, incredibly, the entire cast from the movie will be reprising their roles, and I mean everybody, which should give us quite the insight into what they learned from making the movie. So here's a link to my follow-up video unless I haven't made it yet, in which case you should definitely subscribe so you don't miss it. You know the drill, like, comment, share, all that good stuff. And remember, you can support the channel through my Patreon or by giving me a super thanks. I'd really lesbians you for doing that. Thanks for watching.